Hi, and welcome to this video about classification. Have you ever thought about the millions of organisms that exist and how they're all connected? Maybe you've thought about how a marmot and a bear might be related because they're both furry and walk on all fours. If you're thinking like this, you're thinking a lot like Carl Linnaeus, the founder of the modern taxonomy system we use to group organisms for scientific research and understanding. Linnaeus used his observations about plants and animals to sort them into taxa or groups so that everything was simplified and organized. Even though Linnaeus's system was morphology based and came before we understood genetics, the framework is still in use. Furthermore, the system is always being updated as scientists learn more about genetics and discover new species. One of the more recent updates has been the addition of a domain taxon or group to the top of the taxonomy chart. This is the largest taxon and separates all living organisms into three main groups, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Both archaea and bacteria are prokaryotes, meaning the DNA in their cells is not membrane bound, and eukarya are eukaryotes, meaning their DNA is contained within the cell's nuclei. Following the domain level, the classification system reads from least specific to most specific in the following order. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. A mnemonic device often used to remember this order is King Philip can only find green socks. After the three domains we discussed, there are six kingdoms. Eubacteria, Archaea, Protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. The eubacteria kingdom consists of prokaryotic unicellular organisms, which includes most bacteria. Organisms in the archaea kingdom are also prokaryotes, and many are found in extreme environments like hydrothermal vents or hot springs. An older classification model combines eubacteria and archaea into one kingdom, Monera. The next four kingdoms are all eukaryotic cells with nuclei and membrane-bound organelles. Protists, such as algae, typically move by the use of cilia, flagella, or by an amoeboid mechanism. Fungi are multicellular organisms without chloroplasts and contain a fibrous substance called chitin in their cell walls. Plantae and animalia are probably more familiar to us as they include plants and animals respectively. When it comes to talking about an organism, we use the last two taxa, the genus and the species, to do so. The two-name method of naming is called binomial nomenclature. For example, bald eagles are referred to as Haliatus leucocephalus. This is the formal, scientific way to talk about them as organisms. Haliatus represents their genus, and leucocephalus represents the species. Okay, so we know they're Haliatus leucocephalus, but what about the rest of their lineage? It is largely based on their genetic similarity to other organisms, but we also know that genetics lead to distinct morphology. Keeping morphology in mind can be a good way to not only help you memorize, but to hopefully help you understand the breakdown of how things are organized. Let's go ahead and go through the entire classification system for bald eagles together, starting at the domain and working our way down. Since they are eukaryotes, they belong to the eukarya domain. For kingdom, they are part of the animalia taxon because they are multicellular, their cells don't have a cell wall, and they ingest food instead of being an autotroph that makes its own food. For phylum, they are part of the chordata taxon because they're vertebrates that have a spinal cord. There are many subphyla that account for other features of their build and skeleton, but for simplicity's sake, we'll keep our scope to the bigger picture. For class, they are considered to be an aves. The order is Accipitriformes, the family is Accipitridae, and the genus is the already discussed Haliatus. Note that the first letter of the genus is always capitalized, and the whole word is also italicized. This goes for any organism. And finally, at the species level, bald eagles are known as Haliatus leucocephalus. Even though it seems redundant, the technical way to refer to the species of an organism is with the binomial nomenclature we talked about earlier. Just like the genus level, the species level is also italicized. 
We can do this for all living things like oak trees, cyanobacteria, and even your cat that's curled up next to you on the couch. Not surprisingly, house cats have a lot in common with big cats like tigers and lions. They're both kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, and in the class of mammalia, order carnivora. Finally, we have a series of Fs, Felidae for the family and Felis catus for the genus and species respectively. So how did the house cat go from a big cat like a lion or tiger to a domesticated cat? We can actually trace this back genetically to the species that most likely preceded the house cat to Felis libica, which is also known as the African wild cat. Domestication and selective breeding of this species have most likely caused this change. Okay, now that we've covered how organisms are classified, here are a couple of review questions to test your knowledge. Number one. Which is the correct order of the classification system starting at the top and moving down? The correct answer is B. Remember, the mnemonic we talked about, King Philip can only find green socks. Two, what is the correct way to scientifically refer to a bald eagle using binomial nomenclature? The correct answer is D. Remember that when we use binomial nomenclature, the genus is always capitalized while the species stays lowercase, and both words are written in italics. Another perfectly acceptable way to write this would be by abbreviating the genus to the first letter of the word followed by a period. So another correct way to write this would be H. leucocephalus. Hi, and welcome to this video on mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Have you ever noticed any interactions between organisms in nature that you thought were especially interesting? Like bees pollinating flowers or clownfish living in sea anemones. Symbiotic relationships like these are all around you if you know where to look. Organisms can use such a relationship to benefit from one another in several ways, such as transportation, food, shelter, growth, and reproduction, just to name a few. So if we take the two examples we just mentioned, the bees pollinating the flowers and the clownfish living in sea anemones, we have two classic examples of how organisms can mutually benefit from one another so that both organisms can thrive. When both organisms in a symbiotic relationship benefit, we call this mutualism. In the case of the bees and the flowers, bees need pollen to make honey, which they use as a food source, so the bees go from flower to flower gathering pollen, which they store in a pouch in their abdomen or on their hind legs, depending on the species. When the bees move on from one flower to the next, some of the pollen brushes off and pollinates the new flower. Both the bees and the flowers benefit from this relationship, so it's a good example of mutualism. Clownfish and sea anemones have the same sort of mutualistic relationship. To other fish, brushing up against a sea anemone is deadly, but clownfish are unaffected by the anemone's sting because they have adapted to form a protective mucus on their skin. So the clownfish is able to live in the sea anemone and in the process keeps it clean, while the sea anemone gives the clownfish protection and a place to live. Another example of mutualism that you may not have thought of is the symbiotic relationship between us, humans, and the bacteria in our gut. Take lactobacillus bacteria for a specific example. Lactobacilli are a common type of bacteria found in yogurt, cheese, and some plants. So when you eat any of these foods, the bacteria will make a home out of your intestines by feeding off of the sugars you eat while simultaneously helping you digest that sugar. Both parties benefit, so this is also a mutualistic relationship. Commensalism is another type of symbiotic relationship, where one organism benefits and the other organism isn't benefited or harmed either way. Golden jackals will follow tigers on their hunt for prey so that they can feed off of the tiger's scraps. The tiger does all of the work to actually catch and kill its prey, but it doesn't seem to mind the jackal cleaning up after it. Since the jackal benefits and the tiger isn't affected, we can say that this is an example of commensalism. Another example of commensalism is one organism using another as a means of transportation. A lot of insects, fish, and other animals use each other in this way, but a good example is the remora. This is a type of sucker fish that will attach itself to sharks and other big fish 
to catch an underwater ride. This in and of itself is an example of commensalism since only the remora really benefits. But this relationship can change to mutualism when the remora feed on the parasites on the backs of these big fish. This leads us to our last type of relationship, which is parasitism. Parasitism is a type of relationship where one organism benefits and the other organism is harmed in some way. Your mind might jump to what we more commonly think of as a parasite, like tapeworms or fleas. These are great examples, because in both cases, the parasite benefits while the other organism is harmed. As humans, we can get tapeworms from the food and water we consume if it is not treated or prepared properly. Once the tapeworm is inside of the digestive tract, it eats a lot of your food for you. So symptoms can range from increased appetite to nausea, but if the tapeworm spreads to other organs, it can be life-threatening. However, parasitic relationships aren't limited to the microscopic or small-scale world. Cowbirds are a species of birds that instead of raising their own young, take advantage of another bird species, since birds cannot easily distinguish between their young. Female cowbirds will lay their eggs in another bird's nest, like a black-capped chickadee, and the female black-capped chickadee will feed both her own young and the cowbird nestling. However, cowbirds are much larger than most birds, so they will demand more of the food and nest space. In the end, this means some of the black-capped chickadee's young will die while the cowbird nestling lives. So, to review, mutualism is where both organisms benefit, commensalism is where one benefits and the other is unaffected, and parasitism is where one benefits and the other is harmed. Before we go, here's a review question. Which is the best example of mutualism? A, a flea and a dog. B, a squid and an anglerfish. C, cattle and crows. Or D, a poison dart frog and a cricket. The answer is C. Crows and other birds will get a free meal by eating insects and fleas off of the backs of cattle, and cattle will get a free cleaning. Both the crows and the cattle benefit, so that makes this relationship mutual. Hi, and welcome to this review of genotypes and phenotypes. What exactly is a genotype? How are genotypes and phenotypes related? How can we apply these terms to real life situations? In this video, we're going to answer all those questions. We'll compare and contrast genotypes and phenotypes to help us understand what purpose they serve in the world of genetics. Before we can fully understand genotypes and phenotypes, we first have to understand alleles. Genes occur at specific locations on each chromosome and are made up of a specific chemical sequence of adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine bases. However, the sequence of a gene on one copy of a chromosome may vary a little from the sequence on the other copy of the chromosome. If that's the case, this sequence variant for the same gene is our allele. An allele is a variant of a gene on a chromosome that helps determine the heredity of an organism. Since we have two copies of each gene, one from mom and one from dad, that means that all somatic cells have two alleles for each trait. Together, these two alleles determine the trait you inherit. Let's take height, for example. Although there are a few different factors that contribute to height, we'll keep it simple and say someone can be either tall or short. Let's say the gene that codes for height on one chromosome has a sequence that reads like this. A, C, G, T, C. Let's say this allele codes for tall. The gene that codes for height on the other chromosome has a sequence that reads A, G, G, T, C. This allele codes for short. Again, because the gene is slightly varied, one sequence has a cytosine as the second base, while the other has a guanine, this is considered an allele. We can assign arbitrary upper and lowercase letters to our alleles to keep them organized. Let's keep it simple and go with a capital T for tall and a lowercase t for short, like this. So we can have the same gene coding for the same trait on both chromosomes, but the sequence variant, or allele, is what produces different phenotypes. Therefore, a phenotype 
is the physical trait that is determined by the present alleles. Phenotypes help us observe and analyze genetic mutations, especially when we are thinking about an experiment to track inheritance of a trait. If we want to know if the dumpy wing trait will appear in the offspring of a male and female fruit fly, all we have to do is look for this trait in their progeny. Sometimes just seeing the phenotype isn't enough. Maybe we want to know the exact allele pairing that caused that trait. This is where the genotype comes in. A genotype is the allele pairing inherited for a particular gene that produces a specific phenotype. In reality, genotype refers to all the genes in an organism, and the phenotype refers to all observable traits of an organism. But in practice, they're usually used to refer to a single gene in question. Now let's bring everything together and look at how genotypes and phenotypes actually affect inheritance. Remember that being a diploid organism means you don't have just one copy of an allele to contend with, you have two. Different combinations of those two alleles are what lead to the observable phenotype, or trait. An individual with two copies of the same allele is said to be homozygous for that trait and an individual with one copy of one allele and another copy of another allele is said to be heterozygous for that trait. So going back to our height example, an individual would be homozygous for height if he or she had the big T, big T genotype or the little t, little t genotype. An individual with a big T, little t genotype is therefore heterozygous. Little t, big t is understood to be the same as big t, little t, so that is why there is only one option here. This is important because whether an individual is homozygous or heterozygous for a trait can mean the difference between passing on an inherited mutation or not. Some alleles have been identified to be mutant alleles, meaning they contain a mutation that could cause a change or disease. If an allele is not a mutant allele, it is called a wild-type allele. This type of allele is considered to be normal. So how do we know if a mutant allele will cause a change or not? It depends on the way it pairs with the second allele for that gene. Another way to say this is that it depends on if the alleles are dominant or recessive. Mutant alleles can be dominant meaning they will override another allele, or recessive, meaning they will not override another allele. Dominant alleles are usually represented with a capital letter, and recessive alleles are represented by a lowercase letter. Let's look at this in more detail using a dimple mutation. Let's say the dominant allele means you have dimples, so we'll assign it the capital letter D. And let's say the recessive allele means you don't have dimples, We'll assign it the lowercase d. If we draw a simple Punnett square, we can determine a genotypic and phenotypic ratio for dimples. For this example, we have mom and dad who are both heterozygous for dimples with the genotype big D, little d. If we fill in the Punnett square by dragging each allele down and across for each box, this is our result. Let's start with the genotypic ratio. We have one offspring that is homozygous dominant big D, big D, two offspring that are heterozygous big D, little d, and one that is homozygous recessive little d, little d. So the ratio is one to two to one. Since the dominant allele is big D, offspring with the genotypes big D, big D, and big D, little d will all have dimples because the big D allele overrides the recessive allele. We also have one homozygous recessive offspring where there is no dominant allele, so this combination will yield no dimples. With this, we can say the phenotypic ratio is three to one, dimples to no dimples. We can also say that 75% of the offspring will have dimples, while 25% will not. This example shows how the genotype and phenotype, while related, 
can give us different but equally important information about inheritance. That's really all there is to it. Let's go over a quick review question to test your knowledge. Which of these correctly describes the main difference between genotypes and phenotypes? A. Genotypes are coding genes, while phenotypes are non-coding genes. B. Genotypes are recessive alleles, while phenotypes are dominant alleles. C. Genotypes are genetic information, while phenotypes are environmental information. Or D. A genotype is an organism's set of genes, while a phenotype is its physical traits. The correct answer is D. The genotype of an organism is all of its genes right down to the specific allele sequence they carry, while the phenotype is all of the organism's physical characteristics. A change in the genotype can alter the phenotype, but not the other way around, because the phenotype is the result of the genotype. Remember that in some examples, we might be looking at a gene in isolation. So when we consider the genotype and phenotype, we're talking about the genotype and phenotype for the specific alleles present for that gene. Hi, and welcome to this video on Punnett squares. Some of the terminology you'll come across when dealing with genetics can be confusing. So we'll start by defining some terms and then put them all together to see how they relate to each other. First, let's remember that human somatic cells have 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes, one from each parent, and one pair of sex chromosomes to total 23 pairs of chromosomes for a wild-type individual. This gives humans a total of 46 chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of DNA that is tightly coiled around proteins called histones. Genes are pieces of DNA found on chromosomes that can act as codes for a specific protein. Our somatic cells are diploid, meaning we have two copies of each gene, one from each parent. These genes influence all kinds of traits, but how do we know which traits offspring will inherit? It depends on the random separation of alleles during meiosis and the random recombination of these alleles during fertilization. Alleles are sequence variants of a gene that produce a certain observable trait or phenotype. We have one allele from mom and one allele from dad for each trait. Mendel's law of segregation states that the parents' allele pairs separate randomly and only one allele from each parent is passed to the offspring. This particular cell in the offspring has two alleles again, and it's the combination of these alleles, or genotype, that determines the observable trait, phenotype. Let's take height for an example. In reality, there are many factors that contribute to the height differences in humans, but for the sake of this example, Let's say a person is either tall or short. Remember that all somatic cells contain two alleles for each trait, one on each chromosome. So the gene for height is going to be located in the same spot on each chromosome from your mom and dad. Even though this gene is located in the same spot and codes for the same height trait, the actual sequence of this part of the gene on each chromosome can vary. Remember, this varied sequence is an allele. So in our height gene example, the gene that codes for height on one chromosome may have a sequence that reads like this, ACGTC. Let's say this allele codes for tall. The gene that codes for height on the other chromosome has a sequence that reads AGGTC. This allele codes for short. We can assign arbitrary upper and lowercase letters to our alleles to keep them organized. Let's keep it simple and go with the letter T like this. The possible allele combinations for this example are big T, big T, big T, little T, or little t, little t. 
These are known as the genotype, or the actual alleles that are present in the gamete for a single trait. Individuals that carry the same alleles are homozygous for that trait. So for height, you can be homozygous if you have alleles that read big T, big T, or little t, little t. Individuals that carry different alleles are heterozygous for that trait, so they have one of each allele and have the genotype big T, little t. Remember that a phenotype is the physical expression of your genes, or how the trait is observed, and we derive the phenotype from the genotype. In our example, we labeled the phenotype tall with the capital letter T. Any time an allele is labeled with a capital letter, it means it's the dominant allele. A dominant allele will win over a lowercase or recessive allele in modes of inheritance. So let's say we have two parents and we want to know what the outcome of their offspring will be. We know that in meiosis, each parent gives one allele copy at random to each haploid gamete it forms. When this gamete fuses with the gamete from the other parent, it forms a zygote. To predict the probability of an offspring having a particular genotype and phenotype from two parents, a Punnett square is a really good tool to use. So let's make a Punnett square for our height trait. Since we're only looking at one trait, this is called a monohybrid cross. Let's say that both parents are heterozygous with the genotype big T, little t. Both parents would be tall because they each have the dominant T for tall allele that overshadows the recessive allele for short. When we want to trace the inheritance for a single trait to offspring, we can use a simple two by two grid like this. We'll put parent one across the top and parent two along the side like so. Starting in the upper left corner, we'll draw the alleles down and across the grid to fill each space. Let's look at the results. These are the four possibilities of what the genotype of parent one and two's offspring could look like. Since the tall, big T allele is the dominant allele, in the first quadrant there is a 25% chance the offspring will be homozygous dominant or big T, big T. This would mean the offspring's phenotype is tall like the parents. Two of the four quadrants possess the heterozygous dominant genotype big T, little t, which means there's a 50% chance the offspring would possess this genotype. Because the dominant allele, or capital T, is still in the pair, this means the offspring would still show a tall phenotype. Notice how the bottom right quadrant has two little t's? This genotype is known as homozygous recessive because it contains two of the same recessive alleles, little t, little t. Because one of the four quadrants contains this genotype, there's a 25% chance that the offspring will be short. Punnett squares like this also help us see certain patterns of inheritance. In our example, we had a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio for homozygous dominant, heterozygous dominant, and homozygous recessive, respectively. This ratio stays the same no matter how many offspring the parents decide to have. We can also see a phenotypic ratio from our cross that shows their offspring have a three to one chance of being tall or a one to three chance of being short. This ratio also stays the same no matter the number of offspring because the results represent percentages. We could say that 75% of these parents' offspring will be tall or 25% will be short. We can also use Punnett squares if we want to follow the inheritance pattern of two traits to their offspring. This is called a dihybrid cross, di meaning two. The important thing with dihybrid crosses is that they show that the inheritance of one trait doesn't influence how another trait is inherited. Meaning, if I inherit the trait for being tall, it doesn't necessarily improve or lessen my chances for inheriting a different trait. This is called Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment, and we can test it with a 4x4 Punnett square.
Let's use the same height trait from our monohybrid cross, but this time let's also consider the trait for having a widow's peak, where the big P allele means there's a widow's peak and the little p allele means there isn't. Both parents will be heterozygous for both traits, meaning they both have the genotype big T little t, big P little p. We'll set it up just like before by placing the possible allele pairings from each parent along the top and side, but this time we'll do it for both traits. If you need help finding all the possible gametes, use the FOIL method where you take the first, outside, inside, and last letters for each trait and write them down. So our first parent would contribute big T, big P, then little t, big P, big T, little p, and little t, little p, and parent two could contribute the same. Now let's fill in all the squares. When we bring the alleles down and across for each square, it's helpful to keep the traits together when we fill in the squares. Now we can see a pretty clear pattern. We have nine offspring that will be tall and have a widow's peak, three that are short with a widow's peak, three that are tall and don't have a widow's peak, and one that is short with no widow's peak. This is the classic 9331 phenotypic ratio that we expect from a dihybrid cross. You can use the same method to do a test cross with different genotypes for the parents and their gametes if you want to see the different resulting phenotypes and ratios. Hi, welcome to this review of asexual reproduction. In this video, we'll go over the four main forms and see what organisms reproduce using these methods. Asexual reproduction means not sexual, so organisms that reproduce this way don't require a mate or sex cells to reproduce. Asexual reproduction involves only one parent organism, so the offspring that come from that parent will be genetically identical to the parent and all the other offspring that organism produces. Along with not requiring any gametes to fuse, asexual reproduction does not require fertilization or the mixing of genetic material, and meiosis isn't necessary, which seems to indicate that asexual reproduction saves time and energy. Sounds pretty good, right? It's generally a lot more simplified and resource conserving than sexual reproduction, so why don't more organisms reproduce this way? For one thing, Asexual reproduction doesn't allow for any genetic variation. If an asexual organism can only produce clones of itself and environmental changes or a disease threatens their existence, all of the population may be wiped out, leading to extinction of that particular organism. In less extreme cases, no genetic variation means less diversity, which means the organism isn't able to adapt or evolve over time. However, there is one way that an asexual species can adapt. Whether a species is sexual or asexual, no one's safe from genetic mutations. But remember that not all mutations are disease-causing. So if an asexual organism incurs a mutation during the replication of its DNA, it might benefit the species and actually help an asexual organism to adapt to its environment after all. Because of this, it's better to say that organisms that reproduce asexually adapt to their environment at a much slower rate than organisms that reproduce otherwise. There are certain advantages that we can't overlook. As a whole, reproducing asexually uses a lot less energy. The process of cloning oneself is a lot simpler than the process of fertilization. During fertilization, genetic information from each parent crosses over and combines to form offspring that continue to grow or gestate for a varying amount of time, depending on the organism. Asexual organisms also don't have to waste precious time trying to find a mate. With all of this free time, the population can increase more rapidly and establish themselves in their habitat much faster. The actual process of asexual reproduction depends on the organism. Binary fission occurs when a unicellular organism splits into two pieces to create two new organisms. This process is common in lots of prokaryotes like bacteria, but the poster child for binary fission is actually a eukaryotic unicellular organism. 
and amoeba. When amoebas undergo binary fission, the DNA that is contained within the nucleus is simultaneously replicated while the cell begins dividing. This is true for any organism that undergoes binary fission. Another very similar process to binary fission is a process called budding. Budding occurs when the parent organism produces a small bud at one particular site that eventually detaches and becomes its offspring. Some plants and simple animals reproduce this way. For example, freshwater hydra will begin replicating cells in a concentrated area of the parent's body, creating a protrusion that will bud off and become an individual. While hydra are multicellular organisms, budding can also be utilized by some unicellular organisms, such as yeast. The parent yeast cell will extend its cytoplasm out to form a bud and then replicate its DNA to be inserted into the budding offspring. Once this happens, the cell will undergo cytokinesis to break the newly formed bud free from the parent. Now the offspring can continue to grow until it decides to reproduce this way. At this point, you might be wondering, what's the difference between binary fission and budding? In binary fission, one organism will divide itself equally to form two daughter organisms, causing the parent's identity to become lost. One cell will divide itself equally to form two offspring. However, during budding, one cell will produce a smaller outgrowth at a particular site. That bud alone is considered the offspring, while the original cell is called the parent. Multicellular organisms aren't limited to budding alone. Another process some organisms use is called fragmentation. During fragmentation, a piece of the parent organism will detach and form the offspring. Let's look at a couple of examples. If a sea star gets into a tussle and loses one of its five arms, that severed fragment can, under certain circumstances, subdivide its cells and form a whole new sea star. Fragmentation is a lot like budding in this way, but there are a couple of important differences. Budding involves a new organism being produced from an outgrowth of the parent while fragmentation involves a portion of the parent's body breaking off to form one or more organisms. Remember that fragmentation is only for living things that are multicellular, whereas budding can occur within unicellular organisms like yeast or multicellular organisms like hydra. The last process we'll talk about today might be the most interesting one of them all, parthenogenesis. Biologists recently discovered that some organisms, like the Komodo dragon, can reproduce sexually and asexually, depending on the state of the environment. Female Komodo dragons are known to mate with males to produce their offspring, but researchers have recently discovered that females can produce an embryo that develops from an unfertilized cell. So here's what happens. Under normal conditions, females will produce haploid eggs, meaning they contain only half of the genetic information they need until they're fertilized by a male. But under environmental stress, or a decreasing population size that limits the number of available mating males, the females will produce a fully viable diploid egg by cloning the available chromosome, which means the diploid egg has two complete sets of chromosomes. For Komodo dragons, females have one W and one Z chromosome, while the males have two Zs. When the female goes through the parthenogenesis, she has eggs that are either W or Z, so she will clone the chromosome in each egg so that they have the genotype WW or ZZ. WW is not viable, so only the ZZ male genotype survives. <laughs> the coolest part is that entering parthenogenesis is not permanent. The female can go back to reproducing sexually if she finds a mate or if the environmental stress is removed. All right, now that we've covered everything, here are a couple of review questions to test your knowledge. Which processes allow for unicellular asexual reproduction? A, binary fission, B, budding, C, fragmentation, or D, parthenogenesis? The correct answers are A and B. Both binary fission and budding allow for certain unicellular organisms to reproduce. Examples of each include bacteria and yeast, respectively. Which processes allow for multicellular asexual reproduction? A. 
binary fission, B, budding, C, fragmentation, or D, parthenogenesis. The correct answers are B, C, and D. Some multicellular organisms can reproduce via budding. In this video, our example was Hydra. As for fragmentation and parthenogenesis, both methods allow for specific multicellular organisms to asexually reproduce this way. Atoms are the building blocks of the universe. They make up everything you see around you. But what makes up an atom? At the very center of an atom is the nucleus, which is made up of small particles called protons and neutrons. Protons are very small, positively charged particles, and neutrons are neutral particles that have no charge. Atoms can have just one proton or they can have multiple. A group of atoms that all have the exact same number of protons are called an element. For example, hydrogen is an element with one proton in the nucleus, and carbon is an element with six protons. In general, an atom will have a specific number of neutrons in the nucleus, meaning the atom won't lose or gain any neutrons for a very long time. This is called a stable atom. Usually, a stable atom has an equal number of neutrons and protons, but there are exceptions. To find the mass number of an element, you add the number of protons and neutrons together. So, protons plus neutrons equal mass number. This gives us names like carbon-12 or carbon-14, which are types of carbon atoms used in carbon dating. Orbiting the atom's positively charged center are particles with a negative charge called electrons. The electrons are attracted to the positive nucleus, but they can escape their orbit by an outside force. Atoms have a certain number of electrons orbiting the nucleus. If the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons, the overall electric charge of the atom is neutral. If the atom has more electrons than protons, its charge will be negative. With fewer electrons than protons, the atom will have a positive charge. The electrons determine how atoms interact with each other. Atoms can share electrons to form molecules, which are particles made up of many atoms. Water is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. These three atoms share electrons. Now that we have talked about the different parts of the atom, let's summarize a few properties of atoms. Atoms have an atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. The periodic table arranges atoms in increasing atomic number. The charge of an atom is calculated based on the difference between the number of protons in the nucleus and the number of electrons orbiting the nucleus. Here's a quick review. An atom is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. The number of electrons will determine how atoms interact with one another and decide if the atom as a whole is positive, negative, or neutral. The mass number of an atom is found by adding together the number of protons and neutrons. And finally, the charge of an atom is determined by the number of protons and electrons in the atom. We interact with water in its different forms every day. It's a simple little molecule, just two hydrogens and one oxygen, but somehow it makes life as we know it possible. Today, we're going to take a look at the physical properties of the water molecule and learn what makes it so special. To understand the macroscopic properties of water, we need to understand the molecular properties first. So let's start by looking at the structure of an individual water molecule. We know the chemical formula of water is H2O, two hydrogens covalently bonded to one oxygen. This means that the hydrogen and oxygen both donate an electron to form each bond. However, even though hydrogen and oxygen each contribute an electron to the bond, the electrons are not equally shared between the two atoms. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, which means the oxygen wants the electrons more than hydrogen. This leads to the electrons spending more time around the oxygen, resulting in a partial negative charge on the oxygen, denoted by negative delta. 
Since the electrons spend more time near the oxygen, they spend less time by the hydrogen, resulting in a partial positive charge on the hydrogens, denoted by positive delta. When electrons are unevenly distributed in a covalent bond like this, the bond is described as polar. This is represented by an arrow pointing to the partial negative of the bond with a plus sign at the partial positive end. You'll also hear this called a bond dipole. So, we've established that each OH bond is polarized, but what about the entire water molecule? Because water is bent, a result of the two lone pairs on oxygen, the hydrogens are on one side of the oxygen, so their bond dipoles add together to create a large molecular dipole. Said another way, water is a highly polar molecule, where one side is partially positive and the other is partially negative. Now, what does this mean for when water molecules get together? Because positive charges are attracted to negative charges, called electrostatic interactions, water molecules orient themselves so that the partially positive hydrogens are next to the partially negative oxygens of different water molecules. This leads to the formation of hydrogen bonds an interaction between a partially positive hydrogen and the lone pair of a partially negative acceptor, in this case, oxygen. Because oxygen has two lone pairs, each oxygen can hydrogen bond with two hydrogens. Thus, each water molecule can have up to four hydrogen bonds, resulting in a highly interconnected web. Electrostatic interactions in hydrogen bonds are types of intermolecular interactions. These interactions are individually weak, much weaker than covalent bonds. But when there are lots of them, they significantly influence the physical properties of the substance. Let's consider this for water. Water is very cohesive and adhesive. That's because of its intermolecular interactions. Basically, because water is polar and readily hydrogen bonds, it forms strong interactions with itself and other polar molecules. In other words, it sticks to things. This is why water is a liquid at standard temperature and pressure. The intermolecular interactions hold the molecules together, stopping them from flying away and becoming a gas. These interactions also make water a good solvent, so much so that it is often referred to as the universal solvent. This means that many substances readily dissolve in water because of the favorable intermolecular interactions. You will often hear these substances referred to as hydrophilic or water-loving, which again simply means that they form strong intermolecular interactions with water. We can use this reasoning to explain other physical properties of water. For instance, why does it take so long to boil a pot of water? It's because the specific heat of water is the highest of any common liquid, meaning water requires more heat, or energy, to increase its temperature. That's because to increase the temperature, the kinetic energy of the water molecules must increase. But to do that, the hydrogen bonds need to be broken, which takes extra energy, resulting in a specific heat of one calorie per gram kilocalorie. Compare this to ethanol, which has a specific heat of 0.6 calorie per gram kilocalorie. It takes almost twice the energy to increase the temperature of water than ethanol, all because of the intermolecular interactions. Similar reasoning helps us understand why significant energy is required to melt and vaporize water. In ice, water molecules are in a set network of hydrogen bonds. To melt ice into liquid water, those hydrogen bonds have to be broken, though they are reformed in the liquid phase. This results in a high latent heat of melting. During the vaporization process, water molecules move into the gas phase, which requires a ton of energy because hydrogen bonds must be completely severed for that molecule to be released. This results in a large heat of vaporization. All right, let's finish with a review. We've examined the structure of an individual water molecule and established that it is highly polar. This allows water to form strong intermolecular interactions, like hydrogen bonds, with itself and other polar molecules. These interactions account for most of the physical properties of water, like its cohesiveness, adhesiveness, and high specific heat.
More generally, we've also learned that to understand the bulk properties of any substance, we first need to understand the molecular properties and the types of intermolecular interactions that molecules can form. Hello, and welcome to this Mometrics video on specific heat capacity, a constant that relates heat transfer to changes in temperature. Temperature is directly related to the average translational kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules in a system. Basically, the faster and heavier the particles are, the higher the temperature. The units for temperature are degrees Celsius and Kelvin. Remember, zero degrees Celsius equals 273 Kelvin, but one degree Celsius has the same magnitude as one Kelvin. Conversely, heat is measured in joules and is the energy transferred between systems at different temperatures that are in contact. Because heat is a transfer of energy, it is known as a process quantity. When heat is absorbed or released by a system, the temperature changes. How much the temperature changes depends on the substance and specifically the specific heat capacity of that substance. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have 47.8 grams of water at 35 degrees Celsius and we put it on the stove. We turn on the stove and transfer 1,000 joules of heat to our water, and the temperature rises to 40 degrees Celsius. In other words, it took 1,000 joules of heat to raise 47.8 grams of water by 5 degrees Celsius. That's kind of a mouthful and seems oddly specific in terms of quantities. This is where specific heat capacity, notated as C, comes into play. It's a standard quantity and is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. With some simple division, we can derive the specific heat capacity of water from our hypothetical cup of water. Specific heat capacity C equals heat released Q over mass times change in temperature, delta T, equals 1000 joules over 47.8 grams times five Kelvin, which equals 4.184 joules per grams Kelvin. From this, we know now that it takes 4.184 joules to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's the specific heat capacity of water. This is really helpful to scientists because once determined, the specific heat capacity can be used to calculate the heat absorbed or released by a system simply by measuring the temperature change and mass. Let's try that out. Let's look at a new cup of water. Let's say a mug of 350 grams that's boiling. The water starts at 100 degrees Celsius and cools down to 90 degrees. We want to know how much heat was released from the water to the surrounding environment. Since we know the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin, we simply need to rearrange our previous equation to solve for Q, the heat released. Remember, heat energy is specific heat capacity times mass times change in temperature. In this example, that is 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin times 350 grams times negative 10 degrees Kelvin, which is negative 14,644 joules. Since we knew the specific heat capacity of water, calculating the heat released from the system was easy. Note here that the negative sign simply tells us that the system, the mug of water, released heat to the surrounding system rather than absorbed it. Now that we've defined specific heat capacity and demonstrated how it can be used to calculate the heat transferred from or to a system, let's look at why the specific heat capacity changes between substances. For example, the specific heat capacity of ethanol is 2.18 joules per gram Kelvin, almost half of water. If we have one gram of water and one gram of ethanol, both at zero degrees Celsius, it would take 4.18 joules of heat to raise the temperature of water to one degree Celsius and only 2.18 joules for ethanol. The liquids reach the same temperature but require different amounts of heat. Why? Remember, to increase the temperature, we need to increase the average translational kinetic energy of the molecules, make the molecules move faster. But the internal energy of a substance is more than just the translational kinetic energy. It also includes potential energy from intermolecular interactions. When heat is transferred to a system, it is distributed amongst the kinetic and potential energies. So, if a system has more potential energy, a smaller proportion of the transferred heat is distributed to the kinetic energy, yielding a smaller increase in temperature. To better understand this concept, let's look at water and ethanol again. In water, there's a complex network of hydrogen bonds between the molecules. 
Those interactions are part of the potential energy and need to be overcome, or broken, to increase the average translational kinetic energy. So, when we heat water, some of that energy is used to break up the hydrogen bonding network instead of increasing the kinetic energy, resulting in a large specific heat capacity. Conversely, in ethanol, there are fewer hydrogen bonds per molecule, or less potential energy, and therefore, a larger proportion of the heat transferred is used to increase the average kinetic energy, which results in a smaller specific heat capacity. Okay, let's wrap up with a review. First, we reviewed the scientific definitions of temperature and heat, and related them using specific heat capacity. Using water as an example, we showed how once we know the specific heat capacity, it is quite easy to determine the heat transferred from or to a system. And finally, we considered from a microscopic view why substances have different specific heat capacities. The pH value of a solution is a measure of its acidity. Most solutions have a pH value between 0 and 14 on the pH scale. Solutions with a pH value of 7 at the middle of the pH scale are called neutral. If a solution has a pH value smaller than 7, it's called acidic. If the pH value is larger than 7, the solution is called basic or alkaline. For instance, vinegar has a pH value of 2.4 and is acidic. Pure water has a pH value of 7 and is neutral. And household bleach has a pH value of 13 and is basic. Note, a solution that is more acidic has a smaller pH value. That has to do with the definition of pH. Generally, the acidity of a solution is defined by the concentration of hydronium ions in it. The higher the concentration of hydronium ions, the more acidic the solution. For instance, a solution with a 0.5 molarity concentration of hydronium ions is more acidic than a solution with a 0.05 molarity concentration of hydronium ions. Let's look at a few common substances and where they fall on the pH scale. Battery acid, a very corrosive substance, is a strong acid Therefore, it falls on the lower end of the pH scale with a pH of approximately 1. The gastric juices in your stomach, which help you to digest food, are acidic too, with a pH value somewhere between 1.5 and 3. Lemon juice contains a citric acid and has a pH value of 2 to 3, just like vinegar. Most soft drinks are quite acidic, with pH values between 2.5 and 4, this is one of the reasons dentists don't want you to drink soft drinks. The acid in soft drinks dissolves the enamel of your teeth. Milk is a lot better for your teeth, with a pH of approximately 6.5. Rainwater is somewhat acidic, with a pH of approximately 5. However, industrial pollutants can make rainwater more acidic, with a pH value anywhere between 2 and 4, which can be damaging to plant life. Pure water is neutral with a pH of 7. Blood is slightly basic with a pH value of 7.4. Seawater has a pH value of approximately 8. Solutions of baking soda are mildly basic with a pH value of 8.4. Therefore, baking soda is used to clean up small acid spills in chemistry labs. Soapy water has a pH value of 9 to 10, which helps to remove the grease from your skin or from dirty dishes. Just as strongly acidic solutions pose hazards, so do strongly basic solutions. Lye, oven cleaner, and household bleach have a pH value of approximately 13, so be careful around them. Hi, and welcome to this review of Newton's first law of motion. In this video, we'll see how it forever changed people's perception of how and why things move. Understanding how and why things move has been the goal of scientists for thousands of years. Over time, calculations and experiments helped pave the way for a deeper understanding of motion, with Galileo Galilei defining the laws of gravity in the 1580s and Johannes Kepler pinning his laws of planetary motion in 1618. The basis of our current understanding of motion comes from Sir Isaac Newton's Three Laws of Motion, which he established in 1687. 
In this video, we'll be discussing his first law of motion, also known as the law of inertia. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a net external force. This statement is much more intuitive than it sounds. One of the key things to remember, though, is that this law is only valid for objects in an inertial reference frame. An inertial reference frame is a frame of reference that is moving at a constant velocity. Let's think of it this way. When you kick a soccer ball and it soars through the air, the soccer ball isn't the only thing that's moving. Remember, we're on a planet that's rotating at about 1,000 miles per hour, our solar system is moving at about 140 miles per second, and our galaxy is rotating at 130 miles per second. So objects that we consider to be stationary on Earth are technically moving at a speed of almost 1 million miles per hour. However, it's generally pointless to include the motion of things like the solar system and Earth when we talk about the motion of things on Earth, like cars or people. What we do instead is use Earth as a point of reference, or an inertial reference frame. That is, we discuss the motion of objects in reference to Earth. Let's take a look at an object in an inertial reference frame that has a velocity of zero. It would seem that there are no net external forces acting on the car since the car isn't moving. But what about gravity? Isn't that an external force? While it's true that gravity is pulling the car downward toward Earth, the car is on the ground, and the ground is providing a force in opposition to gravity. This force is called the normal force. Since you have two equal forces acting in opposite directions, the forces cancel out, meaning that the car does not move in the vertical direction. We define force by the symbol F, noting the force is a vector, which means it has both magnitude and direction. By doing this, we can state Newton's first law, mathematically, as the sum of the external forces is equal to the upward force of the ground on the car minus the downward force of gravity on the car, which is equal to zero. Note that the negative sign in front of the force of gravity indicates the downward direction of the force of gravity. This implies that the upward force is equal to the downward force. Now, let's imagine that someone comes along and pushes the car for a moment, providing an external force and giving it a small velocity. According to Newton's first law, once the external force is removed, the car should continue to move in a straight line with a constant speed for the rest of eternity unless some other external forces come along and change its speed or direction. Mathematically, we could state that the change in velocity with respect to time is zero. What we've just described is the constant motion of an object that is in a frame of reference with zero velocity. However, what if we made the car the inertial frame of reference and discussed the motion of the passengers inside it? Imagine if you and I were sitting in that car and there were no other objects around. In that frame of reference, you and I are not moving with respect to each other. We are both moving in the same inertial frame. If the car changed speed or direction, you would feel it because your body wants to keep moving in the straight line with constant speed. If we look at the head as an object moving in the inertial frame of reference of the car, if the car sped up, your head would feel like it's being thrown backwards. This is because the part of your body that is attached to the car would speed up too, but your head wants to obey the law of inertia and continue moving at a constant velocity, that is, with the same speed and direction. Similarly, if the car were to turn to the left or the right, your head, due to inertia, would feel like it was being moved to the right or left. Let's look at another simple example in which you are trying to push a piano across the stage for your performance at your high school graduation. We have already discussed what the forces should be in the vertical direction, where gravity is pulling the piano down and the stage is pushing back up, so there is no net force in the vertical direction. In the horizontal direction along the x-axis, we can add the pushing force and note that if the piano is not moving, there must be some other force pushing back against you. We can see that the resisting force of the piano is really the frictional force between the floor and the wheels of the piano and the friction in the wheel bearings. Since the piano has a constant speed of zero and no direction, we can state Newton's first law as the sum of the forces is equal to the push force minus the force of the piano. This implies that the positive push force is equal to the negative pull force from the piano. Okay, 
Let's wrap things up with a few review questions. Number one, which of the following is the most accurate version of Newton's first law? The correct answer is C. Number two, when you throw an object straight up, the object will slow down on its way up, stop for an instant, and then come back down with increasing speed in the opposite direction from its initial trajectory. Which of the following statements most accurately describes why this is the case? The correct answer is B. Number three, which of the following reasons describes why an object would not move when you push it? The correct answer is D. Hi, and welcome to this video on Newton's second law of motion. In this video, we will look at Newton's second law, compare it with his first law, and look at a couple of simple, common applications. Newton's second law states the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net external force applied, and it is indirectly proportional to its mass. In other words, more force generates more acceleration for a given mass, but more mass means less acceleration from a given force. Newton's second law is generally written in the form of F equals ma, where F is the net external force causing a mass, m, to undergo an acceleration, a. Since m is a positive quantity, the acceleration vector points in the same direction as the net external force vector. Newton's second law can be considered an extension of the first law for the situation where the sum of the net external forces is non-zero. As with Newton's first law, the internal forces are not included, and it can only be applied in an inertial frame of reference. Let's take a look at both a one-dimensional and a two-dimensional example to illustrate some applications of Newton's second law. Let's say you have someone pushing a piano across a stage. In this example, we are interested in the moment when the person pushes the piano with just enough force to get it moving. Let's set up the situation in which the first law holds, that is, the situation of translational equilibrium. The forces in the y direction, as we have seen, are the force of gravity downward and the force of the floor pushing up. In the x direction, we have the push force of the person in the positive x direction and the force of the piano pushing back in the negative x direction. When the person pushes with enough force to overcome the frictional forces resisting motion, the piano goes from a zero velocity to a non-zero velocity, and any change in velocity constitutes an acceleration. Thus, during the time when the velocity is changing, the net external force causes an acceleration, and Newton's second law comes into play. For the sake of completion, let's toss some numbers into our equation to get an idea of the numerical value of the acceleration. Let's say the frictional force between the wheels and the floor is 10 newtons, and the total friction in the bearings of the wheels is 10 newtons. Using Newton's first law for the x direction, we can calculate the net frictional force to determine the minimal force the person must push with. Newton's first law tells us that any pushing force greater than 20 newtons will get the piano moving. While the person may not have made the numerical calculation we did, they intuitively knew they had to push with a force greater than the number we calculated. So, let's say they push with a force of 30 newtons and calculate the acceleration using Newton's second law, assuming the piano has a mass of 200 kilograms. Restating Newton's second law as the sum of the external forces in the x direction is equal to the push force minus the force of the piano pushing back, substituting in the values we discussed and solving for the acceleration yields a value of 0.05 meters per second squared for the acceleration. We just used Newton's second law to calculate the acceleration of the piano in one direction given the external forces. Now that we know the acceleration, assuming it is constant based on the constant external forces applied, we could use the equations of motion with constant acceleration to calculate the time of travel and final velocity given the initial velocity and initial and final positions. In fact, given those three equations of motion for constant acceleration, you can find any three unknowns given the other parameters. Let's take a look at a 2D example using Newton's second law. In this example, we will also use a static inertial frame of reference fixed on the origin of our mass. Imagine you're involved in a three-way tug-of-war. 
Each person is 120 degrees from the other, and the x-axis is lined up with one of the warriors. Imagine, initially, each person pulled with equal force, and there is no motion, so Newton's first law applies. We can use vector math to show the force components from each person in the x and y directions, starting with the person on the right. We can see all of their force is directed in the x direction, so the force in the y direction is zero. The force from person 2 has components in the x and y directions, as shown. Similarly, the force from person 3 must be broken down into its x and y components, as shown. If we state Newton's laws for the three forces, we can see that Newton's first law holds. Let's say that the person aligned with the x-axis impulsively pulls with a force 1.3 times the force of the others. Using Newton's second law, we can calculate the acceleration of the center and the two people on the left. Let's assume that each person has the same mass of 50 kilograms and the rope has negligible mass. The mass of the system is then 150 kilograms. Now, let's say that F is equal to 100 newtons. Substituting those values into the force equation in the x direction and simplifying, we can calculate the acceleration. Intuitively, we know the direction of the acceleration is along the positive x-axis, and Newton's second law gives the quantitative value for the acceleration, which we calculated to be 0.2 meters per second squared. We just saw simple one-dimensional and two-dimensional applications of Newton's second law. When applying these principles to more complex examples, keep in mind that the concepts are the same, but the algebra may be a little more involved. Nonetheless, Newton's laws can be used to calculate the motion of all bodies in space, as long as they are moving in an inertial frame of reference. To wrap things up, let's go over a few review questions. Number one, true or false? Unlike Newton's first law, Newton's second law is valid for bodies in motion in both inertial and non-inertial frames of reference. The correct answer is false. Both Newton's first and second laws are similar in that they account for motion in inertial reference frames. Number two, true or false. Newton's second law is only valid for bodies with constant acceleration. The correct answer is false. Newton's second law can be used to find any acceleration. Number three, calculate the acceleration of the body in the diagram given the parameters indicated, assuming the mass is not lifted from the ground. Also calculate the force from the floor. Here's the correct calculation of the acceleration of the body, assuming the mass is not lifted from the ground. And here is the correct calculation of the force from the floor. Hi, and welcome to this video on kinetic and potential energy. Energy is a very important concept in physics that helps us describe how much work an object can do. While the word energy is often used in everyday language, the meaning in physics is very specific and may not exactly coincide with the meanings you are used to hearing. Today, we'll be looking at the different types of energy and how they affect the world around us every day. There are two main categories of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy applies to objects in motion. Potential energy is the stored energy of an object and depends on the object's position. Different types of energy may express energy values in different combinations of units, but the standard unit for energy is the joule. First, let's talk about kinetic energy. Since kinetic energy applies to moving objects, it is dependent on the object's velocity. The equation for kinetic energy is kinetic energy equals one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. Here, it is apparent that when V equals zero, the kinetic energy is also equal to zero. This makes sense because if the object is at rest, it won't have any kinetic energy. Also, kinetic energy is directly proportional to the mass of the object and the velocity squared. So the faster an object is moving, and the heavier it is, the higher the kinetic energy will be. Kinetic energy is closely related to work. In physics, 
Work is a measure of the energy it takes to move something a given distance. A force must act on the object in order to move it and cause work to be done. You must take all of the forces acting on the object into consideration when thinking about the total amount of work that was done on the object. So, the equation for work in terms of force and distance is the net work done on an object, W net, equals the net force that acted on the object, F net, times the distance over which the work was done, or D. However, it is sometimes more useful to think of work in terms of energy. The work energy theorem states that work is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of an object. So, work is equal to the final value of the kinetic energy minus the initial value of the kinetic energy. It is also important to note that work can be either positive or negative. For example, if you are pushing a box across a table, the direction you are pushing the box would be considered positive direction. The friction between the box and the table is a force in the direction opposite to the motion, so the work being done by friction is negative. Basically, negative work makes it more difficult to get positive work done. Let's think about an example using the work energy theorem. Imagine you are standing at the top of a building and you are holding a ball over the edge. While you are holding the ball over the edge, it is at rest. If you let it go, it will be in free fall until it reaches the ground and is at rest again. There are several questions we need to ask here. Are there any forces at work here? If so, what are they? Is work being done when you drop the ball? Does the amount of work change as the ball falls to the ground? To answer the first question, yes, there is a force at work here. The force that is acting here is gravity. Specifically, the force of gravity equals mass times the object's acceleration. Gravity is pulling the ball to the ground when you drop it. And the acceleration due to gravity, g, is making the ball go faster and faster as it gets closer to the ground. The positive direction here is downward in the direction of the movement. Since there is kinetic energy when the ball is moving, remember it has velocity, then work is being done on the ball by gravity. So what is the total amount of work being done here from when the ball is at rest to the time it hits the ground? Well, the velocity is zero at both of those times. So the total work done is zero after the ball hits the ground. This is because the normal force of the ground pushes upward on the ball and causes negative work to be done. The work from gravity is then canceled out at that point. However, if we look at the amount of work done when the ball is only halfway to the ground, we will have a non-zero value of kinetic energy since the ball has a non-zero velocity. When we plug this into the work energy theorem with one-half times the mass times the initial velocity squared equals zero, we will get a non-zero value for work. So, the value for the amount of work done will change depending on where the ball is on its way to the ground. So where does potential energy come in? Potential energy depends on an object's position. Unlike kinetic energy, an object can have a non-zero potential energy when it is at rest or when it is moving. The example where we are dropping the ball from the building involves a form of potential energy called gravitational potential energy. As you might imagine, the name comes from the fact that we are dealing with the gravitational force. The equation that we use for gravitational potential energy is gravitational potential energy equals mass times acceleration times the height of the object from the ground. So, in our previous example, the potential energy is at its highest when you are holding the ball at the top of the building because h is at its maximum value. The mass of the ball is not changing here, and g is always 9.8 meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. So the potential energy is entirely dependent on how far away the ball is from the ground in this problem. When the ball hits the ground, it has no more potential energy.
It's important to understand that during the fall from the top of the building to the ground, the ball has both kinetic and potential energy, and both are constantly changing. If you look again at the equation for gravitational potential energy, you might notice that the mg is actually the gravitational force acting on the object. And when we multiply that by the distance the object travels, we get the work done against gravity or by gravity, depending on the direction. So if you're lifting the object up from the ground, you're doing work against gravity. And when the object is in free fall, gravity is doing the work. Work must be computed over some distance or some change in h. It doesn't make sense to ask what the work is at one point, say, three meters above the ground. For work, you might ask something like, what is the work done when you lift the ball from a height of two meters to a height of three meters? So the work done by gravity is actually equal to the change of potential energy. Another type of potential energy is elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy involves any type of object that can be compressed, stretched, or otherwise deformed in such a way that it wants to move back into an equilibrium position. Common examples are springs or rubber bands. Elastic materials all have a spring constant, K, that is dependent on the material and describes how elastic it is. The force of a compressed or stretched spring is described by Hooke's law, where K is the spring constant and delta X is the distance that the spring has been displaced. When the spring is in a stretched or compressed state, the potential energy associated with this state is potential energy of the spring equals one half times K times delta X squared. So let's think about an example of a typical spring problem. Imagine a spring attached to a wall. When the spring is not compressed or stretched, the end of the spring rests at the spot we will call x equals zero. At this point, it has no stored energy. If you compress the spring by pushing it to the left, you've moved it by a distance delta x, and it now has stored or potential energy. The force of the spring is pressing in the opposite direction of the direction that you've compressed it. Conversely, if you stretch the spring by delta x, the force now points in the opposite direction. The elastic potential energy is the same here if delta x is the same. Now that we've learned all about kinetic energy, potential energy, and work, let's test it out with some problems. Let's say you have a bowling ball of mass m on a ramp that is height h from the ground. What is the potential energy when it is at rest at the top of the ramp and when it is at a height of one-third times h? Is it a, zero, zero, b, zero, one-third mgh, c, mgh, one-third mgh, or d, mgh, impossible to tell without knowing how long the ramp is. The correct answer is C. The bowling ball will have potential energy as long as it is on the ramp, so it won't be zero until it reaches the ground. At the top, it is a height of h from the ground, and when it is at a height of one-third h, that is how far it is from the ground. The path it takes doesn't matter. In this same example, how much total work is done from the time the bowling ball is going a speed of v to the time that it hits the ground, assuming it stops when it hits the ground? Is it a, negative one-half mv squared, b, one-half mv squared, or c, zero? The correct answer is a. Here, the initial velocity equals v and the final velocity equals zero because the bowling ball is stopped by the ground. Plugging these into the work energy theorem, we get negative one-half mv squared. 
The reason work is negative here is that we have to take into account the work done by the ground to stop the ball. This value is the network of the ball ground system. Imagine you have a spring with spring constant k hanging from the ceiling. In its equilibrium position, it is a height of 2 meters off of the ground. What is the elastic potential energy of the spring when you pull it down until it is only 1.5 meters off the ground? Is it A, 2K, B, 1 8th K, C, K, or D, 9 8 K? The correct answer is B. You've displaced the spring by 2 minus 1.5 equals 0 0.5, or 1 half meters. Plugging this into potential energy of the spring equation, you get 1 8 K. I hope this review was helpful. Thanks for watching, and happy studying.